Dune is a sci-fi classic, an epic story of the hunt for a priceless psychedelic drug in a future feudal universe, and a new messiah. Do you often dream things that happen just as you dream them? Yes. Over 50 years after it was written, and decades after the first time Hollywood tried and failed to turn it into a blockbuster, now, according to the critics, they've got it right. I must not fear. This is a fascinating conversation with Damien Walter, the host of the science fiction podcast, who's delved deeply into the mythology and meaning of sci-fi. I guess the question is, you know, why this particular story? Because there were hundreds of uh, fantasy novels written that have been forgotten. Uh, there are hundreds, thousands of heroes' journeys made. But this one, for many people, particularly stands out. And I think it's because Herbert captured this transformation. There's something happening to me. How you go from psychological youth to psychological maturity, especially as a man. And we, we maybe have a diminishing number of stories that really nail this uh, for young male viewers. He believes it's one of the most underappreciated and undervalued art forms, showing us visions of possible futures, telling us who we are and what we could become. So when we put aside both like the utopian tech vision of science fiction and the dystopian idea that we're all doomed, I think what's at the heart of it is the psychedelic vision. And it's re-emerging into our culture. All of these ancient spiritual ideas of the transformation of consciousness that we, we still can't consciously or openly talk about in our society. So we do it in a slightly cloaked manner through science fiction. I really enjoyed this conversation. I'm going to host an event with Damien in our digital campfire talking about the deep mythology of sci-fi in about a week's time. So if you want to join that and many of our other events, then become a Rebel Wisdom member and see you soon. Damien Walter, welcome. Hello. So we're going to talk about Dune, the film that's just come out. Um, it's an opportunity to talk about the meaning of Dune and also a broader question about sci-fi. What is it about sci-fi, how do we sort of select the stories that are meaningful at any particular time? What's the deeper mythos of sci-fi? And I'm really excited to talk about it with you. Uh, we first found each other on Twitter. Um, from what I understand, you're a, a researcher in story and myth. You're the host of the Science Fiction Podcast. You're in Bali, as people can probably tell, looking, <laughs> looking, at, the, looking at where you are. Um, and you also, looking at your bio, you're, you're a keen meditator. And we realize as well, you're actually a, a bit of a fan of Rebel Wisdom. So yeah, I'd love if you could tell a little bit about your background and um, what you're hoping to get from this conversation. Yeah, I am. I am. I might be something like an OG Rebel Wisdom fanboy, actually. Uh, and uh, I wanted to thank you, actually, for your for the channel, because uh, I think really good curators often don't get thanked for the work that they're doing. Uh, and Rebel Wisdom has been a definite influence in the development of my thinking over the last two or three years. Uh, it's the channel that I discovered people like uh, John Viveki on. Uh, and some of the areas that I've been looking at with storytelling and myth and science fiction uh, overlap into these areas of uh, psychology and a special developmental psychology uh, and into areas like Viveki's thinking on, you know, the religion that is not a religion and when I interviewed John, we, had, we talked a lot about this, the almost religious role that science fiction seems to to play for people today. So these are all my my areas of thinking. I personally uh, started off as an enormous science fiction nerd. Uh, so June that we're talking about today is really part of my my personal mythos. Uh, I've integrated the character of Paul Atreides kind of into my own in some way. Uh, so it's been massively exciting for me to have the new movie uh, coming out and comparing it to David Lynch's Dune, which is like a controversial classic. It's a great Lynch movie, but maybe not a great Dune movie. So I've had this lifelong love of science fiction that led me into uh, writing a lot 
of criticism about the field. I'm probably best known for writing for The Guardian. I had a long, ongoing uh, column about uh, science fiction storytelling. Uh, and uh, also I've done things like go to the Clarion Science Fiction Writers Workshop, I got to study with some great writers and been very involved with the science fiction community as well. And I try to go from thinking about science fiction into opening up wider discussions about society, politics, philosophy, myth making. So that's a, a little bit of my relevant background. Mm, that's a really good summary. And in this conversation, we put together a few bullet points, maybe good to just sort of let people know what we're going to cover. Um, mm -hmm. Dune and the transformation of the psyche. Sure. Um, science fiction is the modern mythos and gateway to the psychedelic. The power of story, generally, from cave art to metaverse. And what might a 21st century mythos look like? So yeah. fascinating, deep questions. Maybe let's start. I've watched Dune uh, last week. Uh, you've watched it as well. We're going to release mm -hmm. this on the day or the day after that it's released more widely. So I guess most people watching this probably won't have seen it yet. Um, but obviously the story is very well known. It's, it's sort of, it, it's not like there's any real cliffhangers uh, if people are aware of the story or they've seen one of the previous films. So maybe let's start with a sort of recap of the story itself. What, what is the story itself about and what do you think is the, are the deeper themes that it's sure. tapping into? Yeah. Uh, I, I actually, I posted quite a lot to my science fiction group on Facebook about June. And last week, someone was like, can you not spoil that for me, please? And I did have to restrain myself from saying it's 60 years old now as a story. Uh, but of course, many people don't know it. Uh, it's it's something of a cult classic, uh, and it, it surfaces up into popular culture every now and again, but it emerges from the science fiction community. So it was published initially as a two-part serial uh, in what was then Amazing Stories, which is now Analog Magazine, uh, and it won the, I think it was the Hugo and the Nebula Award. So those are the two big awards for science fiction storytelling. And back at that time, science fiction was primarily a literary form. And you had this small community building up around it, which was going to become a very major community. It was going to kind of, I call science fiction one of the major unrecognized cultural movements of the 20th century. You could list it as one of the big art movements, uh, but that rarely happens because it grows out of popular culture. And then June is this weird story. You know, if, if, you, if you don't know June, many of the elements of it are kind of strange. You've got the typical elements of like space travel, but then the characters travel to this, this desert planet uh, which is populated by giant worms, uh, and the worms produce, it's basically worm poo, uh, this, this drug, melange, which is pivotal to the story. And we follow a young hero, uh, Paul Atreides, who becomes Paul Mordeeb, and he is the, the scion of the Atreides family. He's going to inherit that power, but he's also uh, basically the son of a witch, like June is like a medieval fantasy in space. So it has witches, wizards, knights. And Paul is, you know, he is the young hero and he's inherited all of this power, but to manifest it, he has to go through this hero's journey. So House Atreides are destroyed and he goes out into the desert and joins the Fremen and becomes their leader. And ultimately, sorry for the spoilers, like emperor of the known galaxy how much how much greater can you get so that's like the plot outline but then there's so much more that takes place within june as well mm. i mean the fascinating thing for me when i read it relatively recently probably only about five six seven years ago something like that was i felt it felt very derivative <laughs> mm -hmm. sure and sure. Obviously, it felt very derivative because it had so much influence on a lot that came afterwards. Like you can hear it, you can feel echoes of it even in the Matrix. Sort of the Neo, the One. Is he the One? This sort of sort of this yeah. kind of messianic uh, nature of the main character, and like it felt like oh, I can I can see so many 
of these themes through so much other sci-fi and so many so much other storytelling. And in a way, that was a that was a sign of how influential it had been on everything that came afterwards. Um, this particular film, I thought, was really well made. I thought it 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 didn't really put much of a foot wrong in terms of the world building aspect of it. That it really struck a chord on that. The only the only comment I would have is that there felt like there was quite a lot of exposition, relatively clunky exposition, like a lot of information being conveyed in, in fairly sort of, um, like there's a voiceover, there's a narrator, there's sort of like, you can tell there's a lot of heavy lifting that needs to be done. But generally, yeah, what did you make of this particular rendition of, of Dune? Sure, and there's two terms that are well known to science fiction writers, which would be useful for, for people to know. One is the info dump. So that's when the writer has to tell you all of this stuff. Uh, and the more skilled the writer is, the more they can integrate it into the story. But Frank Herbert likes to info dump. So if you read the novel, especially later on, and then the later novels in the series, he will decide to spend pages and pages telling you about an ornithopter or the history of this particular person that you're meeting. Uh, and that's, you know, part of what is going to make the story challenging. I think that uh, Denis Villeneuve, who is, he's a real science fiction fan. He's like the real deal in science fiction terms. I think he did a very good job integrating all of that into the story and getting that first half of the book down to about two and a half hours. And in storytelling terms, he does some some really brilliant things with how he integrates Paul's dreams and how the various elements of the story are woven together. The thing that I only really got on my second viewing, because uh, when I first watch something like June, which I'm so attached to, like my critical mind is going so strongly trying to understand it that it's, it's often hard for me to follow the emotion of the story. So in my second viewing, I was able to um, really get into it much more. And what it has that is really rare is what science fiction fans called sense of wonder which is sense of wonder kind of boiled down to just one word uh and it is that feeling that you're actually there's lots of stories that can give you that sense of wonder but for a science fiction fan it is about the feeling that you're stepping into that reality that is science fictional that you've been to many times as a kid maybe in books and you have a sense of it and then you want to go to the cinema and experience that. And that's incredibly rare. Like maybe films like Blade Runner achieve it. And Denis Villeneuve, he really, really nailed the sense of wonder in June. And I think that is going to make it very popular with fans. It's difficult for me to judge whether, you know, because so many science fiction fans now are like me in their 40s and 50s and 60s. It's difficult for me to judge whether a new generation coming to it, who are maybe 12 years old, whether Paul's hero's journey is going to hit home for them. But I think it probably will. And let's, let's dive into that, because you said you talked about the hero's journey. Obviously, that comes from Joseph Campbell, famously influenced Star Wars. That was sort of almost like built deliberately very methodologically on the hero's journey. Um, so I assume that most people will be familiar with this. What is it, what, what is the hero's journey of, of Dune and what do you think it says about the sort of the, the psychological transformation that goes on with Paul Atreides that was so influential that you say you feel like you've integrated it into your psyche? Yeah. Do you think it's kind of a young person's story in that way? I, I think the hero's journey is intrinsically a young person's story. Because one way to think of it is that it is the first part of a larger journey, what Joseph Campbell kind of discovered. I use the metaphor of like a giant map that will take you on a quest to the edge of the universe. And it has these different parts. And Campbell just really found one part. Uh, that he called the hero's journey or the monomyth. Uh, I think he probably, because it was his discovery, I think he slightly overestimated how universal this one kind of archetypal pattern of storytelling was. But it's certainly there. 
in June. Uh, Frank Herbert probably wasn't aware of Campbell's work. I'm not certain either way. But you can find all of the same stages of the journey in pretty much any archetypal uh, fantasy story uh, and so many of the great myths that Campbell was analysing as well. Uh, and June does this really well. Like you mentioned yourself that parts of it seem very derivative. Uh, and I guess the question is, you know, why this particular story? Because there were hundreds of uh, fantasy novels written that have been forgotten. Uh, there are hundreds, thousands of heroes' journeys made. But this one, for many people, particularly stands out. And I think it's because uh, Herbert captured this transformation that's at the heart of the hero's journey. How you go from psychological youth to psychological maturity, especially as a man. Uh, and we, we maybe have a diminishing number of stories that really nail this uh, for young male viewers. The journey that you're probably going to go on in some form or you wish that you will. I mean, it's such a... It's such a painful struggle, I think, for many young men now that we, this story doesn't manifest for them, which is why maybe we come back to it again in our 40s and our, and our 50s, you know, because we're still trying to go, in a way, through this, this transition to adulthood. And Frank Herbert kind of pins it all together with these elements. You have, uh, like, the loss of the inheritance and then having to remake yourself in the world. Uh, and this psychedelic drug, melange, that's woven into the story. And at the time that Herbert is writing, it's, it's just coming to the forefront that psychedelics, in like the literal chemical sense, are going to become an important part, an illicit part in many cases, but an important part of how we try to make it towards psychological maturity in our lives. So there was a great deal of foresight and vision. Uh, and I think more so than most other stories of the genre, kind of Herbert captures that that sense of transformation. And I think Denis Villeneuve has done that in the film as well. I certainly hope so, uh, that younger viewers will be really compelled by it. Yeah, and you mentioned the psychedelic element. It's, it is fascinating that, I think it was published in 1965 originally, and that was sort of two or three years before the real sort of psychedelic movement began in sort of 67, 68. But it's a fascinating foreshadowing of that and maybe talks to why it became so popular when it did and why, the, why so many people felt compelled to kind of do adaptations of it or uh, film versions of it afterwards because it has this sort of psychedelic ca what, capture. I mean, do you know whether Herbert himself had done psychedelics before then? Because people were doing psychedelics from the 1950s onwards. Sure. Do you know if he had any personal experience of that, and why do you uh, think it yeah, uh, resonated? You no, know, we'd we'd need a a better Herbert scholar than I am, but I suspect he must have uh, to have an insight into the the role that these these drugs were going to play for people in, you know, the transformation of of consciousness. Um, you know, clearly one of the big influences is the savior story. So Paul is literally a savior and Herbert complexifies that part of the story by making it self-reflective so Paul also knows that the savior story has been planted by the Bene Gesserit so he knows that he's kind of a fake savior but nonetheless he goes on this savior journey and humans have been fascinated by savior stories for a very long time like pretty much the foundational myth of Western civilization is a savior's story, is Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, and I think it's really interesting to think about the relationship between these stories, because when we talk about one of the reasons we struggle now, or many people from, you know, a kind of a rational, atheist, secular background, as, as I am myself, you know, we struggle to engage with like the Christian mythos now, because it's all woven up with ideas of superstition and could a man like Jesus have been literally the, the son of God? 
Uh, so instead, we're able to do a lot of the same things through a story like Dune, where that savior story, and you have most of the same stages represented, uh, is placed into a context where we can appreciate it uh, a science fiction context, move it to the future and give it superpowers instead of mirac miracles of Christ. But really, we're doing the same thing. We're kind of entering into the consciousness of the character. And it's, a, it's an interesting argument in kind of biblical studies, what's actually meant by that term savior, because we now associate it with saving the world of the story, which, which Jesus does or which uh, Paul Atreides does. But actually, it was probably meant as it's saving you, the audience, that by going through the psychological transformation of a character like Jesus or like Paul Atreides, you are being saved. You're being given the pathway to your own uh, transformation. And I think when you put the story into those kind of terms, you can see why it retains this this super influence for the audience that it's really uh, targeted to. Yeah, and maybe we'll come back to Dune specifically in a moment, but I'd like to widen the conversation out a little bit and talk about what is it... With sci-fi, um, it seems that the stories that we're fascinated by or the stories that we're choosing at any particular time must say something about the times that we're going through. Do you think that there has been, and in a way, Dune maybe doesn't fit into that so much. It's not the sort of dystopian sci-fi that we're maybe more familiar with. Um, so I, I guess it, it feels slightly more utopian, bizarrely utopian for this time in history, perhaps, because the general mood is very apocalyptic. It's very kind of, um, I guess there's a, there's a lot of fairly apocalyptic stuff in this first film. It certainly, it's more about the destruction of, um, House of Atreides and the sort of the the betrayal and so it has these sort of very dystopian elements to it but obviously the rest of the film is actually quite it, it is becomes a triumph for, for for the main character what do you think so do you think Dune is of the moment or do you think it's not of the moment and where do you think generally sci-fi I think I've heard you talk about sort of the increasing sort of dystopian turn that much sci-fi has taken so what do you think the the sci-fi that we're taken by or that we're selecting as a culture is saying about us and how does Dune fit into that? Sure, yeah. Let me see if I can navigate back to Dune from beginning with a bit of science fiction history because uh, in, in my thinking about science fiction, I think it plays a very major role in our general um, cultural development because uh, we, ha we have this kind of major uh, transition that we, we've been making as a society for quite a long time. And that's how do we let go of our older story about who we are and what we're doing on this planet? And this is the general purpose of, of myths or a mythos that you build up as a culture. Because uh, we're, we're making a, a transition as a culture from our older ways of understanding uh, who we are and what we're doing in the world. And this is what we do with myths. Every human culture has had a mythos that uh, defines its sense of purpose and being in the world and answers these great kind of eternal questions about life. And we had a very strong mythology, especially in the Christian Western world. And we've been going through the process of letting this uh, mythology go and coming up with a new one for all of the kind of tremendous facts about the universe and our existence that science is showing us. So I talk about science fiction as the mythos of science, a slightly different way of understanding it. It's not necessarily directly about thinking about science or taking a scientific idea and extrapolating it into the future. It's a bigger task of making sense of what science is showing us about the world. So there's it's lesser known. It was it was pretty famous in its day, a science fiction novel uh, called Star Maker by Olaf Stapledon. 
Uh, it's published in 1937, and it's a slightly later book in Stapledon's work. Stapledon was a, a British writer. He was also a political activist of the day. Uh, and he was, he was also like a keen amateur astronomer, and he was taking in the information, especially from radio astronomy, which was arising at the time, about just how big it turned out that our universe was uh, potentially infinitely large, you know, and a huge number of galaxies. We just made this discovery that there are tens of thousands or even an infinite number of galaxies. So Stapledon writes this novel about like an ordinary domestic British man who's just had an argument with his wife. And he goes out, I think it might be Hemel Hempstead Heath, that he goes out onto. He's living in London at the time. And he just uh, has like a dream vision that takes him off into space. And he travels across space and time through billions of years, meets alien civilizations, uh, goes on various adventures. And he, in a kind of Star Trek sense, he will land on planets and go and explore those and get an idea of the development of the civilization on that planet. And then ultimately his, his travels take him to meet the star maker, the being who is creating the stars and who has made the universe. And this, it's quite a short book. It's a great read. I highly recommend it for anyone who's, who's watching. But, you know, this had a really big impact. Uh, C.S. Lewis was appalled by it. So he wrote his space trilogy as kind of a response to put God properly back in the picture, a divine God. Uh, Virginia Woolf was a big fan of the book. It influenced Isaac Asimov. So we have these stories that are being written and then the science fiction community, which is forming, especially in America and the UK at time, kind of continue this and start to really think about what are we going to be doing with our new technologies, with our new insights into the universe? Well, we're going to continue what we've been doing on Earth. It's going to be kind of a colonial mission. We're going to travel in spaceships that are like ocean-going ships. We're going to find inhabited planets. We're going to meet the civilizations. We might fight wars with them. We might start trading with them. You get the whole kind of world of Star Trek. And you get this science fiction utopianism that we're going to take technology and we're going to continue what we've already been doing. We're just going to stretch human civilization, kind of modernist human civilization, out into space, into the future, infinitely. This, you know, it doesn't give you the space race, but it contextualizes the space race, that it's an attempt to achieve this. In a way, it gives you Elon Musk today and his, his efforts to, to take us to Mars, because we need to fulfill this very powerful science fiction myth. The problem is we hit a point probably just after the space race where we discover for sure nowhere in the solar system is populated, certainly not with other civilizations, and everywhere else is far, far too far away to have any capacity to get to within our lifetimes. So science fiction has spent a century formulating this new myth for the age of science and then in a very short space of time it just falls apart now many people are still invested in this myth this is their idea of what the future is going to be they want this kind of science fiction but very quickly science fiction goes in a different direction uh, a few different directions so one of those directions is dystopian because if we can't get out into space if we can't find new, uh, what is it that Brett Weinstein calls them, wealth transfer frontiers, where the experience of getting into space is just going to make us richer and more wealthy. If the only way to do that is actually going to be uh, like a mission to Mars, we'll probably just kill everybody involved. Uh, then what is the overriding issue that we're facing? Well, it's actually that we're just trapped on this planet. There is no Elon Musk escape to Mars. Uh, and what's happening on this planet when you turn around and look at it without the mythos of the optimistic science fiction uh, looks like it's all projected on lines into some kind of doomsday scenario, collapse of the environment, 
uh, the development of totalitarian regimes, which was obviously a big theme of science fiction as well in things like 1984 and Brave New World. Um, or then you have uh, the whole area of uh, cyberpunk, which develops within science fiction as well. So that gives you the idea of things like Blade Runner, uh, we might be able to build artificial humans. We can replace parts of a real human being with cybernetic limbs. Uh, all of these kind of cyberpunk ideas. We can upload our consciousness into a computer and live forever in kind of silicon heaven. Uh, but these are all going to be corporate controlled. And we start to realize them with writers like William Gibson, particularly. So the... The kind of cyberpunk vision of being able to build synthetic humans, replicants, androids, um, but we would probably just use them as slaves, uh, being able to replace parts of our body, um, but we might not have the rights to those cybernetic limbs and we have to check them in with a, an Apple store to get them repaired, uh, or uploading our consciousness to a kind of silicon heaven and living forever which again is is a vision of of a positive future for someone like elon musk with his Neuralink device which is very science fictional uh, and that kind of gives you the transhumanist movement which is it's very powerful within silicon valley uh, and it's been kind of slightly made fun of as the, the religion of, of Silicon Valley. So now science fiction is in this place of kind of creating um, fragmentary different mythologies for the different value systems of our age. One of those is very much the dystopian vision of cyberpunk uh, which also kind of ties in with the climate crisis and the meta crisis, I hear it called in places. One is a much more positive, utopian, kind of transhumanist vision that someone like Elon Musk is, is trying to realise. But they're all rooted in, in myth. They are our modern mythos, and they're what science fiction is kind of the, the cutting edge of developing for us. Hmm. And... You mentioned in your kind of bullet points from cave art to metaverse. What, what are you thinking on that? Well, yeah, I've used that term uh, mythos a few times. So it's, uh, it's a Greek term. You know, we have these two terms, mythos and logos, and uh, they've been quite popular in the sense-making community uh, as different ways of considering what our, our culture is doing at the moment. Uh, and I like to kind of put them in a context that when we talk about like ancient and classical Greek culture, I think we're really talking about our own ideas and giving some some background to these emergent ideas. So I think we're once again thinking about the divide between Logos and Mephos. And for the Greeks, you know, Logos is the later part of Greek culture. So it's, you know, understanding the world through science, reason, rationality. Uh, and as we kind of come into the, the modern era, we build more and more on the logos we become what some people call the logocentric society so we're trying to understand the world purely through logic and reason and we lose track of the mythos which for the the greeks was it came earlier so on one hand you could use that as a way to put it aside but it was also more foundational because it's from the mythos that your shared understanding of the world has come. So the Greeks work on the mythos through, um, through theatre. Uh, and the theatre is uh, a sacred experience. You're not just going there to be entertained. You're going there to reconnect with the mythos of your society and to question it and to engage in criticism of it as well. Uh, and these, in some ways, are traditions we've lost. And we've really lost sight of what story is is doing that it's building our our shared mythos for us so it's something i like to do with my students is to ask you know what's the first story 
and we can go through some. Uh, we've actually managed to trace back Jack and the Beanstalk to almost five to 6,000 years ago. Um, but we can go all the way back to ancient cave art. Uh, and actually, the earliest examples of that now in Indonesia are, are traced back to 45,000 years. And we haven't even really started to integrate what that means, that there were human beings painting art on cave walls 45,000 years ago. Most of the rest of the examples are somewhere 17 to 23,000 years old, still super significant. And what are we doing with that cave art? You know, we're taking people bringing them into a, a dark environment, maybe just torchlit, and we have put on the walls all of the parts of a story. You know, so it's the earliest identifiable sacred storytelling experience. And what we do with that story is we're creating the hunter. That's what all of these stories are illustrating. You know, it's not that the hunting wasn't already developing around the same time. But we need to psychologically transform people into hunters. Uh, give them the experience of hunting before they go hunting. That's practically useful. But also develop what all the values of hunting are at the same time. And we do this with storytelling. I say we, they at the time. Uh, and really they've, they've found a... Uh, Story is a technological development. That's a very useful way to think of it. So from that early cave art, we're going to add loads more parts to the technology of storytelling uh, over thousands of years. But fundamentally, whether it's Greek theatre, uh, whether it is the kind of epic storytelling of the Indian subcontinent, where you have these tremendous myths like the Mahabharata and the Ramayana emerging out of there and they had for thousands of years this really powerful tradition of storytelling that formed the whole world of Hindu myth that's still very alive in India. Uh, a little side note, I spoke at uh, the Indian Convention of Science Fiction Authors uh, and I was talking about myth, and one of the feedbacks I got is, yeah, well, you guys need new myths in the West, but we still have our old myths in, in India, which I think is a profound insight there, the differences between the cultures. Uh, and then we, you know, we're building these technologies. Maybe it's uh, cinema, the Western kind of the American century is the American century because they have cinema to go and tell the world what the American mythos is. They have that development of storytelling. And now we're entering into this new age where we've somewhat sidelined our ideas of myth and mythos. We don't think about them very consciously, but we're absorbed in it more than ever. We're binge watching 12 hours of television in a night. We're lost in virtual worlds, in video games. And Mark Zuckerberg is about to build a metaverse where we will be in an environment that is kind of malleable to our intentions. And what will we do? We're going to tell stories there. We're going to be almost permanently immersed within uh, a new realm of myth and mythos. And I think the question is, to what extent can we um, govern that and make it useful? Because so much of our storytelling is actually now uh, quite dysfunctional, in my view. Yeah, you mentioned, the example you mentioned about the Indian myths versus the, the Western myths is very interesting. Yeah. Like, the question that immediately arose for me is, why have we lost touch with our myths? And the answer to that, I think, is John, John Bavakey covers in his 50 hours of awakening from the meaning crisis. Sure. Like that yeah. really deep kind of analysis of how it is we've kind of alienated ourselves from the, the, the sort of the, the grounds of our culture. And, I, and so the question that comes up then is like, what's the relationship? Have you, have you watched, so you're, you mentioned before, you're very aware of John Bavakey's work. Do you, how do you see sci-fi interacting with that kind of arc, that, that sort of historical arc of, of the West? Is sci-fi an attempt to try and reconnect with some of those 
story, some of that mythos that we've lost touch with? Yeah, absolutely. You know, so John phrases it as the meaning crisis, of course, and watching his 50 hours of lectures, which I've done twice now, um, was uh, that really helped me understand some of these missing parts, which I had myself. John's such a great thinker. But you know, our meaning crisis is, is quite clear you know, from one perspective. We understand quite well, kind of in the realms of philosophy, that we've been through this major transition from, I guess the best way to phrase it is the pre-modern world, or you could use some of these terms from like integral theory, the mythic world, spiral dynamics, kind of stage blue. And that was a very long period of human history. And it gave us all of, it was built on myth. Myth was integral to that stage, the pre-modern stage of human develop, development. If you had a city-state, you needed a great myth to bring people together with. Uh, and then we kind of make this transition into the modern era through the Enlightenment, through the scientific revolution. Uh, and the, the overwhelming drive is to get rid of myth. We want to, we want to purge this, uh, this old superstitious nonsense. And we go through this process of literalizing the myth. Which, and which in a way is another sides. form of mythos. Like the idea yes. that we can become <laughs> kind of these purely rational creatures is another mythos and one that doesn't really fit us. Yeah, yeah, that's the point where I get into trouble with uh, the the modern the modernist thinkers, because of of course, unescapably, you're saying that science and technology are their own mythos as well, uh, and uh, I mean that's a kind of a core insight of of various postmodern ideologies as well. Um, but you know, we're trying to we're trying to purge our society of myth. And what we really succeed in doing is just subsuming the need for it. Uh, and so we, we come into the, into the 20th century particularly with this kind of reasoned idea that we no longer need these old mythologies and we've literalized them. So we don't even have to think of their symbolic meanings anymore because we can just dismiss them as not true. Uh, and so what we then start doing is recreating all of these myths within science fiction. Uh, so probably the, the paramount example of our culture is Star Wars. So this is literally a, a, a story about like the reemergence of uh, a, a mystical religious cult, the Jedi, into a world dominated by a kind of imperial technocratic machinery uh, and this battle of good and evil at the heart of it. And you can, uh, you know, do a, a, a census study. And in every census for the last 40 years, the percentage of people who are uh, actively Jedi in society is growing uh, decade on decade. I think we're up to like 7% of the population. And maybe they say it for fun. And maybe we go to massive science fiction conventions like San Diego Comic-Con, which gets, I think, 300,000 visitors now. Maybe we dress up as Jedis for fun. Maybe we talk about our father-son experience of going to Star Wars together just for fun. Or maybe it's playing out this really deep need. Uh, and if we, are, if we do have this very deep need for... I don't even say religion, it's for mythos. I think religion is, is a, a secondary stage built on the mythos, but we need these deep myths. Uh, we need to bring that back into conscious awareness for it not to be a completely dysfunctional and non-helpful manifestations of the mythos around us. And that's with the, partly with the help of John Viveki, that's what I've kind of cognized my my personal mission to make people aware of what it is we're doing with these, with these myths. Mm. And what do you think are the central themes that we're trying to reconnect with through sci-fi? Well, we talked about it a little bit in, in June. The psychonaut, Terence McKenna, he has a, a great line, which I've been trying to track down because there are so many hours of talks 
from Terence McKenna, but I've definitely heard him say it at least twice in his talks. And if anyone can help me find the actual quote, I would love that. And he says that science fiction is the gateway drug to the psychedelic. Uh, which I think is a fantastic insight. I mean, Terence McKenna understood a lot of things, of course, about the psychedelic and its uh, its importance beyond psychedelic drugs. The psychedelic really just means the opening of consciousness, uh, the transformation potentially of consciousness up to some uh, other stage of awakening or enlightenment so all of these spiritual ideas which have always been at the core of our mythic storytelling and you have a really pivotal uh work of science fiction uh which is stanley kubrick's 2001 and it's made in uh, collaboration with arthur c clark who is probably in the single most important science fiction writer of his generation there's a few people who disagree with that, but I'll put it out there as a statement. Uh, and Arthur C. Clarke's idea of 2001, though, is very different from what Kubrick eventually made. Because Kubrick was a myth maker. He was self-consciously a myth maker. He was tremendously arrogant as well. And he saw the mythology of science fiction when it was this very positive tech utopian idea. And he... He thought it was bad myth-making. It, it didn't understand the real future of humanity. So he wanted to remake it, the whole mythos of science fiction. Uh, and so he takes Arthur C. Clarke's story, which is that kind of positive tech utopianism, and he spins it. So you have like two halves of 2001. The first two-thirds of the movie, which is... Um, you know, you had this transition from, hopefully, everyone in the audience, I hope, has seen it. But you have the ape men living on the savannah. Um, and you have this amazing kind of historic transition cut in the film where the ape men have encountered the, the monolith. And uh, the monolith has helped them has awakened like their waking mind, their conscious mind, the tool making mind. And you have this image of the, the ape man using the bone to kind of smash the animal skull, the first tool, like the first weapon. And then he throws that up into the air and it spins. And then it's a weapon satellite in orbit. So Stanley Kubrick has just done all of human civilization, the whole emergence and development and evolution of technology one cut because that's as much as he's interested in because he's not trying to talk about the technology and then he shows you like the the spinning space station and the shuttle going up to it and all of these very science fiction visions and lots of science fiction fans love this part of the movie they love seeing the the emergence into space uh, but again, this isn't what Kubrick is interested in. In fact, he wants to show it to you, to show you that it's not going anywhere. You can go up to orbit. There's nobody on the space station. It's just like a hotel. You can go to the moon and then you can come back. This technology isn't going to take us truly out into space. So then what does he show you next in the film? Basically, he shows you an astronaut like this great mythic symbol of the explorer for modern culture, uh, climbing inside the mind of a computer, of an artificial intelligence, which has become murderous. It shares the murderous impulse of humanity who made it. Uh, and what does the astronaut do? He switches it off. It's like the ultimate symbol for going beyond the mind to some other point. And then you get the psychedelic element of the film, like 30 minutes of swirling lights coming at you from the screen. And the final kind of sequence of Dave Bowman going through all of the ages of humanity and then being reborn as the space baby at the end. And Kubrick's entire point is that the future is psychedelic. 
the way we're going to move into space is not space rockets. It's not this colonialist modern idea of uh, literally Star Trek trial style traveling across space. What we actually need is a transformation of consciousness. So, of course, this is very rooted in the psychedelic era of the 60s that Kubrick admired. But then you see it picked up again. Of course, it's at the heart of June. Uh, you have the psychedelic drug and Paul Mordeeb's transformation of consciousness. And then you have like new wave writers like Ursula Le Guin, sort of left hand of darkness is about the mind's ability to control reality. You have Samuel Delaney and Babel 17, which is uh, how language shapes our reality. You even have Star Wars, you know, what's at the heart of Star Wars, the force and Luke's transformation to be able to wield the force in the world. So when we put aside both like the utopian tech vision of science fiction and the dystopian idea that we're all doomed, I think what's at the heart of it is the psychedelic vision. And it's re-emerging into our culture all of these ancient spiritual ideas of the transformation of consciousness that we we still can't consciously or openly talk about in our society. So we do it in a slightly cloaked manner through science fiction. And that is, I think, why a, a film like June now, or, you know, the, uh, the amazing mythos we have, like the Marvel universe, which is deeply science fictional. I think it's that which underlies their kind of huge popularity for us. Yeah, that's fascinating. I mean, one of your points was what might a 21st century mythos look like? Is that what you think a 21st century mythos is with the sort of psychedelic or the transformational experience at the mm. heart of it? It's kind of interesting as well because John Bavaki is just completing a series called What Would a Metapsychology That Is True to Transformation Look Like? So there's yeah. a kind of, <laughs> there's, yeah. a kind of yeah, there, there, there's a parallel there as well. Yeah, I really enjoyed that series. And the third guest on the series, I've forgotten his name, who was specialized in developmental psychology. Zach Stein. Uh, and Zach Stein, yeah. And he was very illuminating in what he said as well. And some of those models of like integral theory have, which I encountered probably 15 years ago initially, and then it was rediscovering the sense-making community that reconnected me with that. And I can see some uh, many potential overlaps with what, where science fiction might go next, and indeed has gone in the past. So we have foundation on television at the moment on Apple streaming. Unfortunately, I don't think it's a very good adaptation. You follow me on Twitter. I, I've been quite vocal uh, about not appreciating it. And Asimov's books, which were written in like the 1950s, are um, quite uh, difficult reads. They're very dry. And he's not a brilliant storyteller, but he's a great conceptual thinker. And so he picks up this idea of like the evolution of human society that Olaf Stapledon had explored in Star Maker. Uh, and he kind of gets into the idea of what really is the future of humankind. Uh, and he has this kind of setup of the fall of an empire, which you could see as kind of um, like an amalgam of stage blue and stage orange in spiral dynamics, uh, kind of into one society and its collapse. And then he's asking the question of what arises beyond it. And the foundation is like a purely rational scientific society. But then beyond that, is a second foundation and that society and that emergent stage of civilization is about psychology. Uh, and I think this is what we're exploring more and more in science fiction. You know, obviously, as I've said, with like the transformation of consciousness and the psychedelic idea, but, and I'm really intuiting this because I, I don't know yet what the next great myth might be what might the unifying story be that kind of brings us together if it isn't space exploration but one of the stories i found quite recently is uh 
because I go to a lot of effort to see what the new writing is in science fiction. Uh, and then I pick things out that really are saying something new to me. And there's a, a book um, which actually emerged out of a collaborative writing project, which is interesting in itself. Uh, the author is pseudonymous. You can find out who he is, but his uh, pseudonymous name is Quantum, Q-N-T-M. And he wrote a book called uh, There Is No Anti-Memetics Division. And this is a book about um, a branch of the, uh, like the CIA. Uh, so this other kind of science fictional trope, the secret agency, like the, the X-Files, that is managing all of these threats to our society. And within this agency, there's a division that deals with anti-memes. I think everyone is familiar now with the idea of the meme, the idea that copies itself. So what would happen if there were anti-memes, ideas or entities that are specifically ca capable of not being remembered by people, of cloaking their existence. And that's just an incredibly cool idea in itself. So quantum kind of takes us on a journey into the, this fight between the secret service agency and these emerging anti-memes who are a bit Lovecraftian, and they manifest as kind of demonic entities that are taking over the earth. But what really fascinated me is that through this idea of the anti-meme, he kind of tapped into a great idea of the unconscious. That we have like Freud's idea of the unconscious, which is that it's just your, your animal drives. But Jung's idea, Carl Jung, was that the unconscious is much bigger than that. It is all of the realms of the things that our mind just isn't evolved to be able to process and we can't even know what is out there. And of course, Jung goes on this, his epic journey in creating the Red Book and through his later work, of trying to understand these realms of the unconscious and the archetypes. So what I'm starting to intuit is that some blending of the kind of writing that I saw in There Is No Anti-Memetics Division is bringing the Jungian unconscious back into our conscious thinking and that our next mythology is going to take us kind of deep into the unconscious and make us aware of it en masse. You know, we're still not. We're still very rooted in our, our conscious awareness. And I think whatever the next myth is will will be a journey into our inner world rather than the outer world we've been looking at until now. And what are the, what are the sci-fi pieces that you would love to see made? I mean, one of the things that comes up when this question is raised is the culture series of Ian Banks, Ian M. Banks. And I would love to, and there's always been talk about Snow Crash being in development. And I Snow Crash by Neil Stevenson is probably my favorite um, sci-fi piece. And that, that is one of the most peculiar books, one of the most kind of prescient books because there's so much of, of um, there's so much of technology that was sort of prefigured in that. It's also got the best name of a character ever, hero protagonist. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but, but it also, yeah, it, it, it feels like when you read it, there's something, there's something almost feels like a, a download in that book. The, the links that he makes, mm. the kind of, the, the interpretation of kind of the different religious systems in that, like they feel, something feels very right about it. Like he's kind of grokked something very deep and then suddenly managed to kind of turn it into sci-fi. Like in a way, it's a perfect sci-fi book because I think there's a lot of weirdly ungraspable truth like it's it's it feels to me like the kind of book that it's almost impossible that one mind has created and for me it feels deeply psychedelic in a way those kind of visions that sometimes you have in those spaces of meditation or psychedelics where you grok something bigger than your mind can hold and somehow he's managed to kind of get it down um so those are the two that i'd love to see turned into some kind of sci-fi project. What, what do you make of those? And what, what are the other kind of gems that you think 
should be turned into into either a series or a film. I, Ian Banks' culture novels would be so appropriate to the moment that we're we're in now. Uh, and I grew up reading the culture. I probably read the f- the first one when I was thirteen or so on. And they're they're the books that I have reread the most and listened to the audio books as well, because this vision of the utopian society where the minds are benevolently running everything around us is is the idealized vision of kind of liberalism basically and i think ian banks was fundamentally a uh an egalitarian liberal thinker but then at the edges of those stories there's always the suggestion that the minds a could destroy everybody at any time they wanted to the humans have no real power left in the society and they also might be deeply manipulating the characters within it and i think banksy was quite smart to always have the edge of of paranoia around the edge of that and like my experiences on clubhouse recently have been kind of stepping into some huge rooms on there where you have these this tremendous uh paranoia or fear about um, transhumanism which has been picked up by that group of people the silicon valley idea uh, and about the role of artificial intelligence in running humanity so the culture series would be very appropriate to our time the book i would pick and it's related to neil stevenson because he does a riff on it in one of his novels uh, anathem How Neil Stevenson writes such big novels so consistently is a mystery to me. But an anathem is is, uh, a play on the glass speed game by Hermann Hesse. And the glass speed game is probably, if I was going to talk about 21st century myths, Hesse probably got there a century beforehand, actually, because in the glass speed game, not only does he preempt the computer and digital technology this game that the intellectuals of the day can bring together a strain from Mozart and combine it with an Einstein equation uh, and then output from the game like a new synthesis of the two, which is exactly what we're doing on the internet day in, day out now in our kind of synthetic culture. Um, But he then goes the next stage uh, and asks, because... The Magister Ludi of the Glass Bead Game is the central character. He's the master of the game, but the real point of the story is that he walks away from it to live life as an ordinary human. And I think if we're thinking about, you know, the extent to which we're now governed by algorithms, especially those of us who are content creators, but everyone watching as well, uh, the extent to which there's an elite who govern this technology that we can't even understand their motivations. We just don't know what's really driving the emergence of our technology. And the question of when or if are we strong enough to walk away from our technology and its benefits um, to experience a fuller idea of humanity. And I think that's probably the central argument of the 21st century which Ian Banks had as well in the culture novels. And just returning to Dune, was there anything that we didn't cover that you think we should cover? We were, we were quite, quite fulsome on Dune. I think we've, we've covered most of the areas of it. Uh, I have did a, do a deep dive with the seven levels of meaning in Dune because there, there were so many different things that influenced Frank Herbert's thinking but maybe one of them is you know Herbert really preempted the ecological movement as well as the uh, the psychedelic that we were talking about uh, and he thinks about the the cycles of nature the planet Arrakis goes through this cyclical process of being a desert planet and then goes back to being a green world and then goes back to being a desert planet again. Uh, And maybe that's another element that um, 
I doubt it will ever come to the screen because you really need to do the whole series of Herbert's novels, most of which are unfilmable, I think. Uh, but I think it's an idea that people might take from June anyway, because at the moment we're in this process of, you know, with things that I know Rebel Wisdom has talked about, like the meta crisis of we're seeing the, the crises around us, but um, the stage beyond that is the acceptance of the crises and to what level, uh, of course, none of us want to die because of climate change, but to what level is, is our human presence within these systems part of the systems? We're no longer alienated from them. And that was something that Herbert thought about very deeply in the, the later June novels which are a difficult read, but worth it if you want to get more deeply into the ideas. Damien, this has been a really fascinating conversation and I think we've barely scratched the surface of, um, of the topic, but thank you so much for making the time and um, I'm sure we'll come back to another conversation at some point in the future. That would be great. Thank you for inviting me, David. It's been, uh, been an honor. Thank you for watching all the way to the end. If you'd like to join conversations like this, Check out our digital campfire. You get access to a load of member-only films. You can watch live, ask questions, come to our book club, our wisdom gym sessions, and our regular monthly meetups where we share what's going on behind the scenes, and you can also connect with other Rebel Wisdom members. What's more, you can also get discounts on our courses like Sensemaking 101. Check out the link below, and we'd love to see you soon.